Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Futurum Tech Podcast. I'm Daniel Newman, host and CEO of the Futurum Group. Excited for this interview conversation today with someone that I've talked to a few times before, in fact, many times before, and we are going to be talking about some news from our friends at IBM. IBM Ventures has a new announcement around AI, and we're going to welcome back Roger Premo. Roger, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Good to catch up. So let's start with the macro. I think you and I have talked enough to know that we both are passionate about this. And while your news is very important and timely, in my opinion, what's more important is that we've probably had one of the biggest inflections in technology, at least in a few decades. I'd say the internet <laughs> in many ways was maybe the last moment that was this important to not only tech, but really to society. And IBM has captured this moment. It's been core to the company's narrative, its leadership. We've had Arvind on, we've had many other leaders, including yourself on our various shows and platforms to talk about this. But I'd love to kind of get your perspective as we're almost all the way into the year, one year since the chat GPT moment, one year since generative hit the scene, and one year since apparently people thought AI was invented. Joke. Um, how are you feeling about this at this period of time? What kind of uh, observations are you making? Yeah, I, I well, I do think I agree. It's a real inflection point. I'd say, you know, so we'll, we'll get into it on the venture side, but my job is I lead corporate strategy and ventures for IBM. And so first I, from a, as a strategist, I look at what's going on inside of our customers and how they're applying technology. And I think first you see practically every company in the world has digital transformation at the absolute top of their CEO and board agenda. How do you apply technology to change your business for the better, create new customer experiences, new revenue streams, improve productivity. And most companies that have gone through their digital transformation they announced in circa 2017, it didn't deliver. So they're re-looking at it because the urgency on getting it done is higher than ever. And to your point, now there's some real technologies with generative AI. You say, actually, the, what I can tackle with my digital transformation is even more impactful. So we've been on this long journey, but the notion of technology as being the IT department to technology being what separates winners and losers in industries, we're much more to that technology embedded into every company. And generative AI is going to be one of those ingredients that really does separate winners and losers going forward. Yeah, it's been interesting. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of late stage now of the next most recent tech earnings wave. Had the chance, actually, I spent some time with your CEO, Arvin Krishna, but I've, I've spent time just in the past week with Bill McDermott, Lisa Su, um, Michael Dell. And, I, you know, I'm talking to all of these leaders, Roger, and there really, it, you know, there really isn't a word that is more critical in the strategy right now than AI. At the same yep. time, though, we are also kind of seeing, you know, I've got this op-ed I'm working on that's kind of like we are finally, after about three quarters of complete, um, you know, craziness around AI, starting to settle in on, okay, we've got LLMs, we've got generative AI, we've got maybe the killer app, but how do we make money? How, do we, how does yep. it turn into economic value? How do we regulate it? How do we make sure that, you know, the society is better for it. How do we indemnify things that you're doing over at IBM, companies that yep. want to go all in and make the investments, but aren't 100% sure about the fidelity of this technology? These are real questions and they've got operational uh, costs. They've got uh, strategic implications, things that you probably wake up every day thinking about. Um, but another thing, Roger, that's very interesting, you know, you heard me make the kind of joke about IBM was uh, not IBM, AI was apparently new in 2022 when ChatGPT right. was invented. But let's face it, we've got three to four decades of, you know, algorithms being uh, developed. I know people that did PhDs in AI in the 90s. Um, you know, this is not all that new. It isn't really, but it is seemingly this significant inflection. And IBM, by the way, I think it won Jeopardy, right, with its Watson computer some time ago. I mean, talk a yeah. little bit about the buildup to what you're doing and how you're thinking about AI and just kind of remind people a little bit about uh, IBM's, you know, pedigree in AI yeah. and why it's been in this for so long. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, to your point, uh, I think the term artificial intelligence was coined in the 1950s. 
Uh, it's been around for a long time, but the power of computing means that a lot of the visions of what we thought we could do now really become affordable and possible. Um, but to your point, it was 2011 when IBM Watson won Jeopardy. And that was not maybe quite the scale of ChatGPT, but it ignited a lot of this interest. And I think that's one of IBM's core strategic advantages is when you take AI from a consumer context or an entertainment context like Jeopardy and say, how do I actually create value in the enterprise? Because I, I agree completely with your diagnosis from earlier, which is there's been a lot of pilots in practically every company in the world, but actually the companies that are making dollar, you know, the economics of their business have changed as a result of how they've applied it to their business. That's a very small minority of companies at this point. Um, and so that strategic advantage we have is, is actually understanding what it takes to turn an algorithm into business value inside the enterprise. And it does take a lot of things you, you, you started clicking through it. It's the right use case and right place in the business where the, the ROI is correct. AI is actually going to change the company for the better. So picking where to apply it, it's like you start getting to the ethics and governance around it. So we've been leaders on ethical AI for years and have a very strong point of view around how this technology can be deployed and a toolkit that helps enforce that governance so that you don't accidentally have a developer that creates a problem for your business. To your point on indemnification, if they use somebody else's IP in the code of your digital business, we haven't yet figured out what the implications of that are, but it is in a, certainly a murky space. So you want to wrap it with the right governance across the business. And then I think also we'll, we'll get into it, but you also core to our strategies, hybrid cloud, you also want to run that AI wherever your business happens to need it. So we see this generative AI as being, you know, one of the, the things that clients are going through, which is, Hey, I'm not just going to run the AI in the location where one of these large model vendors tells me I needed to run in my factory. I needed to run behind the firewall. So we see a lot of these obstacles in getting from pilot to production in generative AI as things that we've really understood for years. And we've built our company, our strategy, our portfolio around helping companies solve those practical obstacles to turning AI into business value. Yeah. And I think, you know, Roger, if, 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 I, if I'm articulating this correctly too, this is also creating a fairly seminal moment for IBM to consider its investment strategy, to consider yep. how it partners with companies, which companies it partners with, um, how it, you know, builds its communities. You know, there's a new era of developer. We all know there's a, a race that's being won for, you know, the attention of the, you know, it's being fought for the attention of these developers that are building AI. And of course, we know that to some extent, there's this kind of notion of AI writing code and how that's going to change industries as well. It, it's definitely going to speed it up. So the economics here are, are, are compelling, the economics of more efficiency, the ec economics of more productivity. And while there is a lot of kind of the fear mongering that uh, goes on and in an unregulated, uncontrolled um, environment, perhaps AI could become very risk intensive. But I also think that there are companies that have the highest ethical standards that understand how AI can make a difference in industry, make people's lives better, solve major problems in healthcare, solve major problems in yeah. fraud and financial services. Um, you know, and, and that really does fit the ethos of, of IBM. And, and when I say this, you know, look, I, I've been to tier quantum labs and I've looked at what you're doing in, in spaces like that. And there's times even myself, I'm like, great, this is like 100 years out. And I'm being facetious, by the way. It's not. But we can barely think past tomorrow. Right. It's like I don't I want to think about lunch. It's morning. Um, and that's how the markets react a lot of times. Like, how, you know, yeah. wait, so you've got a cool technology you're developing and you don't know how to make money from it yet. Well, this is real. It's tangible. You can make money right now. There's an opportunity to take it to market. And of course, there's a whole startup ether, uh, ecosystem that's been created that's that's really substantial that has to be driving where you're going. And so you have to separate the rational from the irrational uh, exuberance of generative AI. But it sounds to me like the news I'm, I'm, I'm hearing is you're going uh, really to make another wave of significant investment commitment to, to AI now. Talk a little bit about the news. Talk a little bit about the decision. Talk a, a little bit about how you're yeah. planning to build out um, this investment strategy for AI. Yeah, let me just start real quick with just our strategy and then we'll get directly to the news, right? So we've said for years that our strategy was hybrid cloud and AI. And we were very strong on what hybrid cloud meant with the acquisition of Red Hat and open source as that hybrid platform. 
with the AI this year in particular, we've declared kind of our generative AI strategy with Watson X as our platform that we announced at our Think Conference earlier this year. Now we have a number of clients that have declared it as Watson X as their generative AI platform. We've got use cases in production. We're showing real value, kind of taking advantage of that leadership we talked about before. But we also recognize that part of our strategy is also the ecosystem. And the ecosystem may be the big partners of the world. You were naming some names you know, if it's if it is the AMDs or the SAPs or you know that, but it's also the early stage community. And so what we're announcing is a $500 million enterprise AI venture fund to help us invest with the early stage community to, to help those early innovators that are going to help. And it's it's AI for business. It's, that's why we call it an enterprise AI venture fund. So we're not, you know, there will be phenomenal consumer applications that are going to come out of generative AI. We're really help working on, we want to work with the early stage community that helps enterprises take advantage of it. And maybe new capabilities that are created for the enterprise on top of generative AI. It may be a lot of the steps, if it's security or operations or price performance or governance, the things that enterprise need, enterprise will need to bring these platforms to life. So we're looking at the early stage community around this and, and really saying that we want to lean in together, both to invest in that community, but then over time to build the partnerships and product integrations and go-to-market integrations that help that early stage community succeed with IBM as well. Well, first of all, I, I, I love that you've put the prefix of enterprise. And the reason I love that is I think that alone allows you to have a much more uh, thoughtful thesis and eliminate, to your point, what's going to be a lot of very cool companies that Silicon Valley uh, investors, you know, on the West Coast might want to play with, you know. Um, and by the way, like you said, it's not about those not being good. It's about having the, I think the investment strategy matched to some extent the business strategy, meaning, you know, are you incubating the kind of companies that could potentially become part of IBM? Are you incubating the kind of companies that will build on IBM? Are you incubating the kind of companies that will be solving the enterprise challenges? The enterprise challenge is so substantial, but the way we mostly societally describe AI is much more consumer. You know, we talk about, you know, talking to your car, you talk to your phone, you're talking to your, you know, and you're asking it to, you know, you know, order food or deliver a package, or you want to find the movie you want to watch tonight, things like that. But the application of, you know, taking an enterprise's information database and enabling something like drug discovery, uh, enabling something like uh, anti-money laundering. Just, you know, and by the way, again, doesn't it sound a little bit like some of the things you're doing with Quantum I, when I think about some of the big, biggest applications, but also scale. I mean, Roger, great talent. You know, you want to invest in it, but it's, it's, it's hard to find. There's lots of functions, businesses that generative AI can offset so you can make the best and, and most significant investments in your most critical people. I'd love to know a little bit of the process, though, kind of how you're going to think about this, because, you know, 500 million is a lot. It's it's you know, how are you going to distribute it? Is it going to be yep. small investments? Are you looking for bigger seed into some companies? Kind of have you thought about kind of what's going to be the uh, criteria for yeah. these? Uh, yeah, I'd say a couple of things. Well, first of all, we already got a head start on it. So in August, we 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 invested with a number of other strategics in Hugging Face. And then we recently placed an investment in Hidden Layer, which is the leader in AI security for this large language model era as well. So we're already down the path on it. We tend to invest at the a relatively early stage. So seed to series A, maybe a smaller series B. The lines on those continue to move on what those check sizes are, especially with some of the investments some of these companies need to train models or, or work in the space. But I also say part of the process that we've been piloting. So about a year and a half ago, we really changed the IBM Ventures model. And we think we do have kind of a best in industry way of participating with the early stage community. And it's a model we, uh, when we kind of went around and kind of did a listening tour of what was successful in kind of corporate venture arms, it was really figuring out where IBM as a business can help differentiate that early, early stage community and bring differentiated value to them. And so that's part of why it's AI for business. If IBM was participating in the consumer tech industry, we have, that's not our area of expertise. We wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't bring something incremental to that, that early stage community. But what we do is we try and pair people from our product teams that are deep domain experts with an investment team that is 
decades of investing experience. And together, that means when we're talking to an early stage community, we company, we can very quickly figure out, you know, the best places they can plug in, how we can support them, how the, how the insights we have might help shape some of their agenda. And so it's that kind of advice and acceleration and collaboration that comes from bringing not just capital, but these deep domain experts to collaborate with that early stage community. And then we also pair it with a portfolio management function. So as we've been piloting this and we've got these great success cases of companies that we've invested in, we've already exited from some that, you know, went straight from on our radar screen as a venture investment to an IBM acquisition, but this portfolio management function that has also helped stand up commercial collaborations, product integrations with that early stage community. So they're really seeing value. And I have some, some of the companies that have been part of that new IBM ventures model that say, I can look at a double digit percentage of my growth and say, I can directly attribute that to the collaboration with IBM. And so that's not what we do up front when we place the investment. It's what we do downstream as we continue to collaborate with our portfolio and IBM as an investor can be an advisor and an accelerant to their businesses because, you know, we have that kind of history and expertise in the spaces that they're covering. Yeah. I would actually say Roger as a builder and someone that, invests in early stage companies, um, it's often underrated. Money itself uh, has become, you know, maybe in the most, uh, you know, wildly exuberant times in like 21, when money was just splashing around the valley and investors, could it be, could the problems of founders be solved with a check? But I think what you just said, it, it deserves a little extra attention. And that's um, these, these people that are building companies need advice. They need strategy. They need connections. They need partnerships. They need support. Sometimes they need a. Sometimes they need therapy. And I say this with uh, the, the, you know, I mean, look, you know, we've all seen kind of the the the, the straight up into the right line of a, of a successful founder is not straight and up into the right. And you know, I saw a quote the other day, and I don't know if Messi actually said it. You know, the soccer player, one of the best of all time, arguably the best. He said something like, "It took me 17 years, 244 days, and some odd hours to become an overnight success." And I think when right. you start up, you're constantly up against that. You know, yes, it, you do eventually arrive, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of nuance in that journey, um, and so it's great to hear that you're kind of thinking about more of the holistic uh, partnership, all the you know all of the connections and relationships and ecosystems and technology you can offer, not just money, because I think we often how much is it worth? That's what everybody spends time. How much is it worth? Um, another thing I just want to lean in as I was reading through this and you, you did kind of mentioned, but you're also investing in the ecosystem in companies that are a little further along, like Hugging Face. Um, you know, we've all seen Huggy Face has been one of the stars of the AI boom. It has been highly relevant and visible throughout the uh, last year of generative AI. It, and it sounds like you're sort of making your, your, your continuing to reiterate your bets as it pertains to going down the open route when it comes to LLMs. You know, we know that there does seem to be a very kind of, there's two schools of thought. There's the build it, centralize it, own it, control it thought that some big tech companies have. Um, and then there is the very democratized approach. And it seems like IBM's all in, including its money and its technology on the democratized approach. Yeah. Listen, we, uh, I think that will be a debate that rages, but I, I think we've already seen the evidence, right? That through this year that I think the world is moving to a multi-model future on this. I agree. We've seen so much innovation. If it's what Meta is doing with Llama 2, if it's the open source community, if it is fine tuning a small model to get similar performance to a large model at a much lighter cost point. I think we fundamentally believe that accessing millions of innovators versus a handful of innovators and a few companies that closely control them will allow our customers to get better value from from this technology. And I think, you know, Hugging Face, as you said, I mean, Hugging Face is kind of the community where so much of that open innovation is brought to bear in the large language model and sorry, gener the foundation models overall. Um, yeah, and that, that was probably a, a little bit later stage than we typically would, but it is so tightly, all the investments we're also gonna do, right? Because I am the strategy leader and, and ventures on my team as well. Everything we're gonna do is aligned to our strategy. And to your point, hugging face, open models, open source, being able to run these models wherever the company, you know, the enterprise needs to run them. That's, that is so highly aligned to where we're headed as a company that even though it's a little bit out of our strike zone on 
kind of stage size, the strategic alignment meant it was a great investment for us. Yeah. And uh, you, I like that you said that I was going to re reiterate that if you didn't was, you know, the kind of picking open versus closed. And that's yeah. in cloud, for instance, a very significant debate. And when you picked Red Hat and made that massive investment and then kind of went open hybrid and kind of even in your entire hybrid strategy, and even in your hyperscale infrastructure strategy, really said we're, you know, our approach is open, open, open. We will work with everyone. That's where we you know, we as IBM would win. And I, I think this is just another way to reiterate that. I tend to agree with you. Um, we're even seeing it in terms of layers of abstraction where people are coding. Jax and PyTorch moving up the, the rank, not to get too yeah. technical, which is going to, could potentially open doors for new um, silicon innovators. Yeah. Because, you know, obviously when, when a lot of libraries developed in CUDA, and this isn't a NVIDIA plus minus, I'm just saying, there's all these talk of the lock-in. Well, if you can remove layers of abstraction, make the code more portable, moving between silicon, moving between infrastructure, it changes the calculus of the business. And so you're seeing it, developers, nobody wants to be locked in is my take. Um, some will be, but no one wants to be. Um, and I think being open in the long run will win, even if sometimes those more narrow ecosystems short-term act as, as really good enablers. Um, Roger, as we kind of wrap up here, is there anything else about the kind of overall AI ventures and strategy that you want our community and our viewers to, to hear about? Um, I think we covered it. Listen, I just think it's uh, our hybrid cloud and AI strategy continues to kind of bear results for IBM, bring results to our clients. And so, you know, with Watson X as our generative AI platform, this, the, the enterprise AI venture fund becomes a way to accelerate that strategy and work with that early stage community. So I, I think the main thing is for folks that are the innovators in that enterprise AI space, we want to talk with you. We want to collaborate with you. We want to succeed together. So I just ask anybody that's watching that has a great early stage idea, early stage company, you know, reach out to IBM Ventures, ibm.com slash ventures, and let's start our journey together. All right. Well, you heard it here, everyone. Uh, those of you that are building enterprise AI, this may be your moment, uh, not just money, but strategic support and help. And uh, as someone that's worked with Roger and the team at IBM for a long time, I definitely say this is one you should consider talking to. Roger, that's going to wrap it up for here today, but I want to thank you for joining me and let's do it again soon. I'm sure we will. All right, everybody, you heard it. So hit that subscribe button. Join us for all the Futurum Tech Podcasts and interview series here with the Futurum Group. For this show, for this episode, it's time to say goodbye, everybody. We'll see you later. Mm -hmm.